everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm Lisa Wask, and I'm the director of the Superior District Library. For those of you who don't know me, for those of you who do, welcome back. Um, Teresa Irish is um, kicking off her UP tour here at Bayless. We're very pleased to have her. Um, five and a half years after finding her father's World War II letters, um, she brought a thousand letters home to print. As the book's author, publisher, and distributor, this has truly been a labor of love. She has been at over 180 venues, appeared on ABC News, NPR, Veterans Radio, Military Author Radio, Frontlines of Freedom, and the nationally syndicated National Defense. <laughs> a Thousand Letters Home was named Reviewer's Choice by Midwest Book Review and was recognized by the Military Writers Society of America and the Writers Digest Self-Published Book Awards. Wow. Teresa is a 1984 graduate of the Michigan State University. She has worked in higher education, the staffing industry, and most recently as vice president for a national home health care and hospice company. She retired in April 2012 to devote her time to sharing this poignant story and the accompanying message of citizenship in today's world. Teresa lives in Northfield, Northville, Michigan, and is married to Colonel Brad Foster of the United States Army Reserve. And Brad is going to be shipping out, so, so this is their kind of uh, farewell vacation as well. Um, both hardcover, excuse me, and softcover copies of A Thousand Letters Home will be available for sale and signing following the presentation. Please welcome our guest speaker, Teresa Irish. I well, you'll hear me okay, I promise. I'm not too bashful, and I heard you. So, Well, thank you. There's so many people to say thank you before we start, because as you all know, the library is not usually open on Monday nights. So my thank you to the staff, my thank you to Tender Care, who has sponsored our um, refreshments in the back, and to the friends of the library. Um, this is a really exciting time for us. For two years, we've been working on a schedule to come up here. We had one library that invited us two years ago, and fortunately, we've just been really busy with book events, but we live down in the Detroit area. And today is day one of 11 events in the next 13 days. So it's a busy time, and uh, we're headed to Curtis and Engadine, Ironwood, Iron River, Iron Mountain, uh, St. Ignace, let's see, I'm forgetting a few more, Indian River as we drop back down, St. Helen and Mayo, but we couldn't think of a more beautiful place to start. Matter of fact, it's such a lovely day, we weren't sure who'd want to come inside for a program, so thank you all for that. We thank you very much, Harold. And we spent our day taking a little boat tour, so you can't come up here without doing the suit tour, and what a beautiful day. So thank you so much. I have to start with the disclaimer that I am not an author by trade. I'm an unintended author. I just happen to have been left an incredibly amazing gift by my dad that sadly I would find one month after my dad died. And before I start to tell you the, letter of the, jour the journey of the letters, through photographs up here, I'd like to introduce you to my sweet mom and dad, Bud and Elaine Irish. My father was a 20-year-old dairy farmer from Hemlock, Michigan, when he went into World War II. Anybody know where Hemlock is? Okay, one person, all right. Anybody know where Saginaw is? All right. Okay, well, if you go through Saginaw, out M46, due west, you come to the little town of Hemlock, where my father was the only son with four sisters. His twin sister, Faith, born 60 seconds ahead of him when they were dairy farmers. And if you go a little further out M46, you'd come to the town of, of um, Merrill, Michigan. Turn right on Meridian Road, and you would come to the Corbett Farm. It's still there today, actually. My mother was the eldest of six children. My father put an engagement ring on her finger, the accompanying wedding band and his life savings, whatever that would be as a 20-year-old dairy farmer from Hemlock, Michigan, into the savings and loan bank. And along with 16.2 million other Americans, 
He went off to fight a war that would change our world. My dad wrote in one of his early letters to my mom that he remembered going to a dance at Hemlock Hall. And it was Nelson Hall, actually, in Hemlock, excuse me. And he looked across the dance floor and he saw this beautiful brown-eyed brunette. And it was love at first sight. My mother would write back to my dad that she remembered that night as well as their very first date. December 16th, 1942, to see the movie Down Argentine Way. She also remembered thinking that he had to grow on her a little bit. <laughs> but she knew that he was a man of great faith and family and character and manners, and he was worth another look. Later on, my dad would write to my mother, and he said, if it's God's will that I make it back from this war, I'm going to marry you, and we're going to have two, maybe three children. And the first will be a boy. Well, he ended up coming home three years and two months later. And by golly, he married her 20 days after he got home. And one year later, they welcomed their first child. And it was a girl. A, girl. a year and a half later, they welcomed their second child. And this time, it was a boy. A girl. <laughs> well, another year and a half later, this time on my dad's birthday, they welcomed their third child. And it was a boy. Girl. Okay, you have a 50 50 chance here. Let's come in. Girl? Another girl? It was a boy. It was a boy. It was a boy. His first son born on his birthday. Well, the fourth was a boy, the fifth was a boy. The sixth was a girl. The seventh was a boy. Wow. The eighth was a girl. I like to tell my mom they got better as they went along. <laughs> the ninth was a boy. Oh my God. And the tenth was a girl for five sons and five daughters over the course of 20 years. Oh my God. Wow. We knew growing up that we had something special in our family. And I even really honestly, I knew that as a child. I knew because every single night, whoever had the earliest bedtime, everybody else had to come together, gather in our living room or our family room, and kneel together in prayer as a family. My parents had this big, long, rectangular table built for our family with a two-sided wraparound bench for our dinner table. And when my parents called us to the table, one kid after the other would just slide across the bench and around the corner. <laughs> And if we had friends over, you just slid a little closer, because what's cooking for 13 when you're cooking for 12? And you know, when you got a little bit older, 15, <coughs> 16, 17, you had more important things to do than sitting at dinner with your family. So when we got called to the table, I might yell back, no thanks, I'm not hungry. And my dad always responded the very same way. Then come sit at the table and let us see your smiling face because we're going to have dinner as a family. Music was a huge part of our lives growing up. My father was playing the guitar publicly and singing at the age of 11. We sang outside on Christmas, or outside our cottage bonfires and we sang on Christmas Eve amidst Fisher Price toys and festivities. Music was a huge part of my dad's letters. His parents sent him his guitar when he was at Camp Maxie and Camp Swift. And he would write that after they finished the training maneuvers in the hot Texas sun, that 90 of them sat outside the barracks and sang. Later on, amidst 194 consecutive days of battle in northern France and Germany, my dad would write a letter to his parents that in the bombed out homes they found enough pieces of instruments to put a couple of them together. And he would write to his parents and say, for just a little while tonight, we're going to puff out our chests and forget about this war. Music was an important part of my parents' courtship. My mother was unable to go see my dad very much when he was stateside because sadly, in the course of the book, my mother's mother receives the last rites three times. Mm. She's the oldest of six, they're on a farm, the men are all gone. So she can't go visit my father very much when he's at any of the camps in the States, but my dad came up with the solution. He writes her a letter and he says, you know what we're gonna do? Two times a week, 
two times a week for one hour, we're going to know exactly where the other is and what they're doing under the same billowy moon. Because we're both going to make our, our ways to a radio, and we're going to listen to Waltz Time and Hit Parade. As a matter of fact, many of my dad's early letters in the book, when he's stateside, he writes one through ten at the end of his letters, and he starts writing the countdown as it's playing. And one of them in particular, he stops and he says, wait, hold on. That new fella, Frank Sinatra, is singing Shoo Shoo Baby, and you should hear those girls scream. <laughs> Music would be a huge part of my dad's life, literally to his very last breath, something I'm going to tell you a little bit more about later on. Now, my dad was this optimistic, positive thinker. I remember in the cold December winter mornings, we went to parochial school, so we had our little parochial uniforms. And you'd come out in that low, dense, cold ceiling in a December morning, half asleep, it's still dark outside. And my dad would stand before us and say, come on kids, let's hear it. Boy, am I going to have a good day. And of course, as kids, you'd say, boy, am I going to have a good day, can I go now? And off we'd be out into the world. Well, he had this whole litany of sayings. In all things, always do your best, and then in God you leave the rest. Up man and try, never say die. You have to dream your work and work your dreams. And whatever you dream about, whatever you believe, whatever you foster in your mind, whether it's roses or weeds, that's what you're going to grow. He had a saying that he used to love to remind us as kids and say, you have to remember every single day of your life to use the three H's that you've been given. Your head, your hands, and your heart. So he always had this optimistic words for us. And I remember when I went away to Michigan State and I was so homesick fall semester. I called home one day in tears. Poor me, my freshman year, and I'm sharing this little tiny room with this other human being. I have these really hard classes and these really hard professors and I have to walk like all the way across campus and be there at like 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Woe is me, life was so hard. And I remember calling home, being in tears, so homesick, and my dad answered. And he said, you know, sweet, you have to flip that thinking. You have to change that attitude because you become what you think about. Every day is an opportunity. You have to decide it's going to be a good day. You have to decide you're going to make it turn out well. And in the midst of my dad's litany of sayings, I would interrupt him and say, the most appropriate response, is mom home? <laughs> my mother would understand. Well, you know, I remember the first time that I looked at my dad through adult eyes. I was 21 years old and I just graduated from Michigan State and I took a job sight unseen in Pocatello, Idaho. Oh now, anybody ever been to Idaho? <laughs> oh wow, I got a few people, all right. I was born there. Born in Idaho, not Pocatello. Really? Wow. I need a prize to give away for that one, that's a first. <laughs> You know, the years I lived there, six years, I'd come home and everyone say, now you live in Iowa, right? Because nobody ever thought about Idaho. Okay, well that's a first for me, I have to tell you. Well, I remember being in my mom and dad's driveway in Saginaw, Michigan. My little navy blue Chevette, packed to the hilt with everything I owned, ready to take off. Now my poor little mom, I'm quite sure she never slept. My whole drive out there, which was about 36 hours. She wanted someone to go with me. My dad offered, but I was adamant, no. I'm grown up now and I'm gonna do this by myself. Besides, Mom, what could possibly happen? This is America. If my car breaks down in a highway and 36 hour drive, anybody will stop and pick me up and take me into their home. What could possibly go wrong? Well, that day, as my dad hugged me goodbye, his eyes welled up a little bit. And he said, you know something, sweet? I was 21 years old when my mom and dad took me to the train station to go fight a war that would change the world. I'm so pleased and so proud that at 21 years old, you have the right and the freedom and the liberties to go anywhere in this world that you dream. You know, prior to that time, I sort of saw my dad as a governing body 
what time you had to be in. My oldest sister, he was particularly hard on. My parents had this clock in their room that showed the time up on the ceiling. So when you had curfew and you had to be home by that time, you never could sneak past them because all they had to do was look up at the ceiling. My oldest sister would come in and my dad would say, come give me a kiss goodnight. And she'd say, no, that's okay, you're sleepy. He'd say, come on. And he always wanted to check her brow. So we always had these rules and things we were trying to get past. The other big thing I remember growing up, we used to come in up at our cottage and we were going to go out skiing with our friends and you'd run in the house and everybody's already in the boat ready to go. And as you're grabbing the keys, you're saying, Dad, can I take the boat? And my dad would always say, I don't know, can you? And you'd go, oh, man, I'm sorry, Dad, may I take the boat? And my dad would say, wait five minutes and ask again. And you'd say, oh, Dad. And to this day, I am so programmed to always say, may I versus can I? So I was so aware all the time of this governing body in my life. Until my dad said those words to me that day, I never thought about him as a young man. A young man with his whole life ahead of him. And his days, along with those 16.2 million other Americans, many who lied about their age to get to go serve. Many who tried so hard to hide any disabilities because they wanted to go serve. I never thought about the fact that they didn't get to think about where they were going to go to college and what they were going to study. Many who had never left their counties, let alone their countries, were going off to fight this evil in the world. And it was an amazing moment as I stood there that day, thinking that about my dad's life and how my parents never put those stories in front of us as part of when I was growing up. Well, I came home that Christmas, and we went to a place that we always used to go. Did you have Bill Knapp's up here? Anybody remember Bill Knapp's restaurants? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody remember what we like to eat for dessert at Bill Knapp's? And chocolate cake. They had those little round birthday cakes. My dad always ordered chocolate cake. My dad believed you should eat the best part of the meal when you're hungriest. So when we had our entrees, he had his big piece of chocolate cake, ice cream, hot fudge, whipped cream, everything on top. And he caught up with us about the time of the entree. And that particular day, the waitress came to the table and my dad turned to her. And he says, points to the menu, which I thought was odd he was looking at a menu anyway, because we went there all the time. And he says, oh look, Tricil, Idaho trout. And I thought, boy, where's this one going? My dad turns to the waitress and he says, my daughter runs the university out there in Idaho. <laughs> now mind you, I'm 21 years old and I've been there for four months. I said, Dad, I don't run the university. Please don't tell people that. He says, oh yes, she does. That place didn't know what it could be till she got up there and taught him how to run an administration. I said, Dad, please, I mean, I don't run a university. But I had learned many years earlier. There's no arguing with my father when he's going to talk about his kids. Well, about eight years, eight or nine years later, was the second time that I remembered seeing my dad through adult ties. My sister has been at Ford Motor Company for 45 years. She's the assistant to the CEO of Ford. You can offer her $1 million to stand up here and talk to you tonight, and it would never happen. She is the best organizer. She is the best behind the scenes person. She is the wing beneath your wings. But she will not stand up in front of her. She doesn't like any attention. Well, she calls me on the phone one day and she's completely stressed. And I said, what's the matter? I could hear it instantly in her voice. She proceeds to say, oh my gosh, they're having a luncheon in the executive boardroom to honor my anniversary with the company. I said, why is that a big issue? You've been there for years. And she said, no, no, that's not the problem. The problem is, they just called and told me to invite mom and dad. <laughs> now, I knew what my sister was worried about. Bill Ford was coming to that luncheon, and he's going to find out who runs Ford Motor Company, and it's nobody in the Ford family. <laughs> my sister, who doesn't like any attention, being so stressed, she said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm sure she expected my dad would show up with pie charts and graphs that correspond with the stock price of Ford and her milestones or something with the company. And I have to tell you, I don't know where this came from in me, 
because I remember thinking this when I was younger. I said to my sister, you know what? Some people would have something like that and they'd have to be afraid that their dads came to something and drank too much. We just have to be afraid that our dad is too proud of us. I could feel my sister's relief through the phone and she said, thank you for the rest of my life for giving me that way to look at dad. My dad gave us a wonderful life. My dad came home from the war. They started a wonderful family. They gave us great discipline, but great love. They helped me understand what unconditional love was. He went on to be very successful in insurance. And through the decades, decades, decades later, into their 60s, the first town in France, the little village to be freed from Hitler's rule, invited the now white-haired gentleman from the 102nd Infantry Division back to honor them <coughs> and to thank them for liberating them and giving them their freedom for the decades that followed. Sadly, the night before they were to go, my father became ill. He wasn't able to make the trip. Ultimately, he would be diagnosed with prostate cancer. But his attitude, up man and try, never say die, kicked right in. He read, he studied, he talked to doctors, he talked to other people, and soon my dad found his new calling. He was a speaker for a prostate awareness group on Grand Rapids called PACT, Man to Man out of Florida. He was on radio stations, and any day we came home, he was on the phone with someone newly diagnosed in the U.S. and Canada, telling them, this is not the end of your life. This is just a next difficult journey. As a matter of fact, before my dad passed away, he spoke to 600 physicians for the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. And my father's message was asking them to please see the human being in front of you. Don't do radical procedures and surgeries that take away the quality of their lives. Treat the symptom, but see the human being that's there and help them maintain their dignity as they deal with their challenges. I'm happy to tell you that before my father passed away, he lived another 16 years and he welcomed more grandchildren and children. He came home just two years before with a Venice Double Senior Tennis Championship Trophy. Well, in the winter of 2006, it became clear to us that my dad's time was drawing near. I was 44 years old at the time, I'd never been married, and I literally flew out of the Detroit airport 40 to 45 weeks a year. So any day or any weekend that one of my siblings wasn't with my parents in Florida, I would fly down there to be with them. And I'll tell you something, over the years, unlike many veterans, my dad did talk about the war. He talked about the war on Christmas Eve when amidst Fisher Price toys and music and all the festivities. At some point in the evening, he'd raise his hands and he'd say, 47 years ago tonight, 52 years ago tonight, 59 years ago tonight, and ultimately, 61 years ago tonight. And he would talk about the events of Christmas 1944 in Germany. My dad would write a letter to his parents dated just two days later and said, Dear Mom and Dad, well, I suppose you're wondering how I spent Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. They were spent on the banks of the Rohr River. The river itself is about 75 feet wide, but it has a mighty swift current. The ground was frozen, and there was snow on the ground, but we didn't complain about the cold any because that meant that our tanks could roll and our airplanes could take off. At midnight, he wrote, the Germans started playing Christmas carols and putting up propaganda, and then all of a sudden a church bell would ring deeper into Germany. I turned to Hayes the next that morning, he said, and I said, it's so interesting. Here we are, Germans and Americans, sitting across a little river and thinking of peace on earth, when each of us is just waiting for the other to move so that we can riddle one another with bullets. At 4.30 Christmas morn, he wrote, my thoughts turned to home, where it would be almost Christmas Mass. You folks would be there or on your way. And it made me think about all my other old buddies and where they might be in the world tonight and whether or not we'll be together again next Christmas. My dad also talked about the war every April 9th. April 9th, 1945. 
It was so close to the end of the war that as families were receiving Western Union telegrams, they were hoping that it was news that their boys were on their way home. My father was part of a five-man reconnaissance troop, the 102nd Infantry Reconnaissance Troop. And those of you who know about recon, their job is to go out and to seek out German activity, to quietly spy on it and come back and report to the command station and they'd send the in the Air Corps or the infantry. Instead, that particular day on April 9th, my dad would write a letter to his parents a couple days later telling about those events. He explained to them that they went into an area in Steinberg in Germany when suddenly they were completely surrounded by the Germans. He went on to write in his letter of April 12th that they opened fire on us, some from no further than 10 feet away with something similar to our Tommies. Nobody could move without getting hit. He said, we did what we were trained to do. We jumped out the Jeep, one to the left, one to the right, one to the back. And as one guy and I tried to take cover behind a rock that was nearby, he wrote, I could feel every bullet as it entered his body and took his life. My dad went on to explain how he went down and he played dead. And the Germans came over and they picked up their rifles. And they walked down the line and they hit each of them over with the head with the butt of the rifle to make sure that they were dead. He said, I decided to lay there, and it was like waiting a million years. Eventually, the Germans left. He continued to play dead, he explained, but then all of a sudden, he heard them marching back. This time, it was Hitler's SS. My dad would write to his parents and say, my heart was pounding so loudly that I was sure that they would have heard it. Instead, the Germans came back and they took all their gear, their guns, their jackets, they drove off with their jeeps, and with it went everything I owned over here, he said. Eventually, he heard a call for help. Help, help. He explained that he learned in training that you never respond to a call for help in English, because that was a tactic of the enemy to call out in English. And then eventually my dad figured out that it was two guys from an armored division that came in to try to take cover, get them under cover, and instead each of them took a shot in the leg. My dad wrote and said, or called to them and said, just stay here, put your belt on as a tourniquet, and I promise I'll be back for you. As he went running through the woods he rode, he jumped off a little bridge into a river. And he said, folks, I was never happier to see anybody in my whole life. There was Cliff Bohr, the Jeep driver sitting in the river with a bullet through his wrist. Cliff said, I want to go with you, and my dad said, I can go a lot faster without you, but I promise you that I'll be back for you. He made it back to the command post, and he wrote the name of someone in his letters that I eventually found about three months after my dad died, a gentleman living out in California, and he said, I'll never forget that day. Your dad came out of the woods, no helmet, no gun, no jacket, completely disheveled, and I said, Irish, what are you doing out here? He said, we took him to the commanding officer, and your dad said, we've got guys back there still alive, and I promised them that we'd come back. The commanding officer said, we can't send anybody back. We can't send medics into that area because we've lost so many, sending them into hot zones. My dad was insistent, and the commanding officer agreed in one condition. My dad had to agree to stand on the outside running board of the ambulance holding up a white flag to see if they drew fire from the Germans. He did, they did not, and they brought his buddies back. Two days later, he received the Silver Star, eventually the Purple Heart, and two Bronze Battle Stars. But any of you who know of those who have served in our, our country, some of whom we have in the room with us tonight, they know that those citations and those medals are something they would gladly give up for what it represents that they experienced and they saw. Well, I happened to be down with my dad that winter that he was having hard times and I'd set up home health care nurse and my dad's wonderful nurse Candy came in. Of course, the first thing my dad had to do was sing a song with Candy's name in it. He sang to everybody. He didn't have to know you. And he, Candy came in and I, I have to tell you, I'm pretty sure Candy figured out early on to give my dad two patient visit spots. One to do his care and one to listen to him. <laughs> well, she finished his care. And my dad said to Candy, you know something? I shouldn't be alive today. And I know it's not my time yet. You see, God spared me on April 9th, 1945. That very day, without explanation, he took the lives of my three buddies 
Don Case, Barney Stone. My dad would write to him, or to the parents of them eventually, and he said, I never could explain to them why their sons died. But he said, I know that the fact that I was allowed to live meant that I had to come back and do something more with my life, and it's not my time. I walked Candy up to her car that day, and she said, I'm sorry to tell you, but I think dementia has set in. I said, it's not dementia, it's April 9th. Well, soon after, my dad was in and out of the hospital with blood transfusions, and we knew it was time to bring him back to his beloved Michigan. He was unable to fly commercially. We were never going to get him home driving. So my mother and I accompanied him on a medical charter. We flew into the Saginaw Midland Bay City Airport. My brothers got permission to pull their car out to the plane. The nurse checked out my dad. The pilot put down the stairs. And who was standing at the top of the stairs with his arms raised to the heavens singing the green, green grass of home but my father? <laughs> my brothers pulled me aside and said, I thought you said he was dying. And we said he was. We didn't even think we were going to make it home. But he had this whole new resurgence of life and energy and purpose. Well, because we're a family that believes you should talk openly and honestly about the challenges that you're going through and the choices that you have, the next day, we invited a hospice nurse in to tell my dad what his options were. He listened very patiently to her, and he said, Thank you for what you do. But you see, I won't be needing your services. I just know it's not my time yet. God has more than I'm supposed to do on this earth because, you see, I was given the gift of life when my buddies weren't. And for that reason, I know there's more I'm supposed to do every day. It's really quite something. I was on a radio interview one time, and they said, do you think your dad had survivor guilt? And I almost recoiled, because if you knew my father, you knew that he had survivor purpose. Even though he'd seen some awful things, and even though his buddies didn't come back, he felt that it would be worse if he lived with every day being a burden, instead of seeing the gift of what he was given that others did not. So he thanked that hospice nurse, and he said, I won't be needing your services yet. As a matter of fact, he said to that nurse, 61 years ago today, I told her all the events of April 9th. There are three themes to this book. The first, it's a first-hand, real-time account of a soldier's journey through World War II. From his first days at boot camp down at Fort Custer, through Camp Maxi, Camp Swift, the Louisiana field maneuvers, riding a Pullman train all the way across the United States to Fort Dix. He wrote on the boat ride across to Germany. He wrote during 16 months in northern France and Germany, eight of which were an army of occupation. He wrote to my mother, his fiance, he wrote to his parents, and all his letters were intended, regardless of what he had to share, to tell him his optimism and how right we were to be there, and that he was safe, and these reassuring words to them an ocean away. The second theme of the book, it's a beautiful love story. The first half on the state side are beautiful correspondence between my mother and father. And the third theme of the book, it's a beautiful book of faith. My father was a Catholic, and his faith in God was so strong and he wrote all throughout his letters. The first thing that he did when he got to any new camp is he went and he found the chaplain and he said, I'm your new altar boy. He was so pleased and so proud that when the chaplain came out and found him out in the uh, woods to do mass, my dad was so proud that his Jeep, which he aptly named, Why Worry? The hood of his Jeep was used as the altar to celebrate mass. And he would write that amidst their 194 consecutive days of battle, when the chaplain finally came and found them and they found a bombed out shelter in Germany to sit, he'd write a beautiful letter to his parents that as we knelt together in prayer in that shelter, from private to general, there was no rank, as we gave thanks for the fact that these were not our homes and our towns because there's just nothing left, followed by the prayer that we would please be brought safely home back to our families in the States. Well, because of my dad's faith, the day after the hospice nurse came when he was unable to leave his bed any longer, we decided to invite our parish priest in. 
And I'm telling you, he walked into my dad's bedroom and my dad just beamed. He said, you know, Father, life is good and God is good. And I don't know why I got to live when my buddies didn't, but I sure hope that he's proud of what I did with the gift of every single day. At the end of that time that day, we weren't sure who gave the last rites, Father Heller or my dad. <laughs> Actually, it was my dad. But it was very beautiful, and we got to share that as a family. Sadly, the next day, my dad lost consciousness. And on a beautiful, picture-perfect light tonight, a beautiful Tuesday evening, April 25th, 2006, it became clear that it was time for my dad to leave us. So for the last hour of his life, we decided to give him back something he'd given to us all our lives. We surrounded his bed, and we sang. Tell me why, you'll never know, heart of Jesus, silver-haired daddy of mine, how great thou art, amazing grace. And just as my brother started to pull out his guitar and start playing the green, green grass of home, for the first time in 24 hours, my dad appeared to open his eyes, sing along a few words, and quietly at 8.23 p.m. he left us. It was as beautiful a moment as you have when you're given the gift of faith and family and time and love. And to this very day in my life, it's the greatest single honor of my life to have been there at the moment that my dad left us. Well, I had to go back on the road soon after. It was a month later, Memorial Day weekend, I was working in Atlanta and I called my mom in Saginaw and I said, you know, I just feel like I need to go to your house this weekend while you're all over the cottage and I just need to have a good cry. Of course, my mother said yes. I flew home from Atlanta, got to my house in Detroit, and it was 11.30 on Friday night of Memorial Day weekend in Saginaw when I pulled my dad's army trunk in from our back porch. That trunk had been in our lives, our home, my entire life, plus 16 years before. We used to say, Dad, how about we come home someday and go through the trunk with you? He always gave the same response. Maybe someday. He, we never pushed. He never invited. So the contents remained a mystery in our lifetime. As I sat now at the foot of my dad's empty chair, I thought back to all those times he talked about the war. And I'm not one that believes in regret, but if I had one, if I had one, you know when someone tells you something over and over in your life and you say, yes, I know, you know, Christmas Eve and April 9th and you think you've heard it? I didn't know until I read my dad's letters. I had never even begun to hear what he was trying to say. Well, I opened that trunk and on the top tray had something many of our veterans would have, currency from a foreign land, a German Luger, a couple of Dagers, it had his field mess kit. It had a program from a mass celebrated in a foreign country. It had a USO concert flyer from a program by Bob Hope and Martha Tilton. I took out that top tray, and right beneath it, literally left to right, front to back, were my dad's 1,000 handwritten letters. Each of them in the original envelopes on that thin onion paper. Can you picture that old paper? Two-sided, teeny tiny hand script, some with as many as 12 pages in one envelope. Well, I never went to bed that night. And I'm not proud to tell you, but I will say truthfully that when my mother came home that Monday, and we went out to the cemetery to attend the Mass that day and to visit my dad on Memorial Day, I was 44 years old, and I felt like I had never seen an American flag or a veteran in my whole entire life. I had a whole new reverence and appreciation for both. I was with my dad one time when he said to someone, you know, I can't explain why, but I feel that ever since God let me live on April 9th, every time I've put a slice of bread in the toaster, God has popped me back up a loaf. Well, I have to tell you, this is what's happened to my life since starting the journey of the letters. My first loaf of bread happened about a year after my dad died. We received a notice of the last reunion of the 102nd Infantry Division 
in Cincinnati, Ohio. Straight shot down 75 for me. I knew I was supposed to be there. My mother was very worried, thinking I'm a glutton for punishment. It was 104 veterans and 500 of their family members. I was going by myself, but I knew I was supposed to be there. The very first morning in a room about five times this size, I sat and I looked at the back of the now white-haired gentleman as they celebrated a Catholic Mass. I thought, wow, I wonder how many of them were the ones that were gathered around the altar called Why Worry, or that were gathered in that bomb shelter where there was no rank as they gave thanks for their families being safe at home. Then that night they had a last, big, final banquet. They lined the tables from left to right up front with very simple white tablecloths and votive candles all the way down. And if any of you have ever had the very sad misfortune to attend a funeral for a fallen troop, you know that they do roll call. They call the name of the fallen troop, meant by silence for those who can no longer answer, three times. That night, they went through the roll call, and they called each of the troops within the 102nd Infantry Division. And it was as beautiful as it could be. You could hear a pin drop in that room of 600 people. Then after dinner, this 14-piece big band started playing. And they played a song that came to mind. Not only because it's one my father and I had sung together when I was young, but because my dad writes a particular letter to my mother. And he says, I don't care how many gas ration coupons you have to use. If this movie comes to Midland, you have to use those gas ration coupons and you need to get there. And when you hear this song, you need to imagine that it's me singing it to you. Well, the movie was called Hello Frisco Hello. The song was made famous by Miss Alice Fay. And it goes something like this, and if you know it, I hope you'll join me. I know I got a good singer in the front row here in Harold. And it goes. You'll never know just how much I miss you. You'll never know just how much I care. And if I tried, I still couldn't hide my love for you. You ought to know for haven't I told you so a million or more times? You went away and my heart went with you. I speak your name in my every prayer. If there were some other way to prove that I love you, I swear I don't know how. You'll never know if you don't know now. Well, after that, they... What's that? I didn't hear much. <laughs> they were listening to you. I gave the microphone. Well, after that, they did one more song that it was really important to me, not from World War II, but from 1918, another one my dad and I used to harmonize on. And if you know it, I hope you'll join me. With someone like you, a pal good and true, I'd like to leave it all behind and go and find a place that's known to God alone. Just a spot to call our own. We'll find a perfect peace where joy will never cease. Somewhere beneath the kindly sky We'll build a sweet little nest Somewhere out in the west And let the rest of the world go by Good one, all right.
Well, these two wonderful gentlemen that adopted me and being by myself turned to me and said, how does a young thing like you know the words to those old songs? And I said, oh, gentlemen, we're just getting started. <laughs> well, my next loaf of bread came to me about two, two and a half years after finding my dad's letters. Included in his trunk were five letters. They were written from the mother of Don Case and Jack Davis, two of my dad's three buddies that were killed on April 9th. My dad wrote a letter to his parents explaining to them that they all made a pact. If anyone lived when the others died, whoever lived would promise to write to their families. So my father went to his commanding officer and he said, after the, the government has officially notified their families, may I please have permission to return three things to them. The money in their billfolds, the pictures of their gals that they all carried with them throughout the war, and their family Bibles. As a result of them writing to my father, of course, they wrote back to my dad. And to me, these letters are some of the most poignant letters in the book. As you can imagine, a mother's broken heart for a son who's been laid to rest a world away. They're filled with questions. Do you think Don was afraid to die? Do you think he believed in heaven? Do you think he wanted to come back and work this farm when the war was over? Please, they both wrote. Please, when the war is over, come visit us. We'll love you like a son, like our Don, like our Jackie. Well, I had such a gift in my dad's letters that I knew that I needed to find the living siblings of those soldiers, even though their brothers had been killed 65 years earlier. It became a very important thing to me. And because of the Internet, <clears throat> excuse me, I was able to find them. As you might imagine, it was quite a shock to them. But in the end, they were so pleased. They were so pleased to know I was publishing them because they said, you know something? The kids in our family, they know they had an uncle who died in World War II. They know that they had a cousin who died in World War II. But they said they don't know his story. And they were so pleased that I was going to include in the closing chapter a chapter called Fallen Comrades. And both those families sent me pictures to be included in the book. One of them, a picture of Don and his fiancée, Patricia, who, of course, he never came home to marry. And also, the last portrait taken of their family with Don in uniform with his two younger brothers, his sisters, and his parents, the last photograph before he left. And amazingly, they also included, all these years later, they still had a letter that my dad's mother wrote to their mother upon hearing of the death of their son that they sent back to be included in the book. My next loaf of bread happened on April 9th, or June 9th, 2009. Once again, sitting at the Trade Airport, probably in a business suit with my latte on one side, my Blackberry on the other side, I was reading my parents' letters. My mother had gone to see my dad before he left. He wrote and he said, you know what, we're leaving really soon. I can't tell you anything, but if we're going to see each other again, you have to come to Fort Dix pretty quickly. My mother's mother, who I told you, was sick for years. She wasn't able to travel much, but she took the train to Fort Dix, of course, accompanied by a chaperone, his twin sister, Faith. My dad writes a letter to his parents of July 17th, 1944. He said, you know, Mom and Dad, it was the happiest five days of my life. I was a soldier by day, and I danced and made, or made music records with my sweetheart by night. They celebrated Elaine's 22nd birthday, and the next morning my dad delivered them to the train station. He had to be back to the post before the train left. Well, I sat there in the waiting area of that Delta flight that morning on June 9th, and I was reading that letter. And my dad writes to his parents that he got back to the post, and there was a Western Union telegram waiting for him. And it said very simply, by the way, the original telegram was in my dad's trunk, now, of course, in the book. And it said, Bud, Elaine's mom died this morning. Good luck, Dad. My dad writes his parents that he is just torn over what to do. Does he go back and tell her and have her have a 12-hour train ride back to Michigan with a broken heart? Does he go AWOL because he can't imagine leaving her and having her face this alone? But then on the other hand, he said, the Army's been good to me and I can't imagine not going out and shipping out with my, my brothers here that I've been training with. 
As I sat there reading that letter at the airport on June 9, 2009, I all of a sudden noticed the 12 soldiers in their battle dress uniforms that were boarding my plane. How many times in this, our longest war in the history of our country, was I not aware of the soldiers that may have been boarding my plane? But I had a whole new appreciation for it now. I was so sensitive to it. And the six foot three soldier sat across the aisle from me, and you don't usually talk across the aisle on a plane. But I was so drawn in, and I said, are you heading home or heading out? He tells me that he's headed for his last six months of three years in Kuwait and Qatar. He told me what it was to battle the elements, the heat and the sand, and how they live in freight containers. They take freight containers like you see on the trains, and they stack them up, and those are the officers' quarters out there. I shared my dad's letters. I told him about the journey. We talked the whole entire flight. I'm happy to tell you that at the age of 49, I became a first-time bride when I married that man across the aisle. <laughs> Thank you. And it's a especially special trip for me right now because my husband just got back from 10 weeks of active duty. He's leaving for a year on October 18th, but the happy news is I'm glad that tonight I can introduce my husband, Colonel Brad Foster, in the back of the room. So let me tell you, any of you that are all over your kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews about getting married and settling down, 49, when I first got married, last time I got married too, honey, I meant to say that the right way. So some of us just do things in a different order in life. So the amazing thing that I have to tell you is Brad and I met on the airplane. He was on his way to Cutter. And in the end we learned, I live in Detroit, Livonia, or uh, Northville area. I live in Livonia at five mile, or six mile in Haggerty. Brad lived at five in Hagerty. Oh, wow. <laughs> and let me tell you, when you're 40, 42, 44, 46, and you've never been married, you're goosenecking around for anybody who doesn't wear a ring. So how I missed him, I don't know. <laughs> so Brad came home six months later. We had our first date. I called my mom and said, oh, Brad's coming home. And I decided to like make a pot of chili and put some cookies in the oven because the poor guy's been living in the desert, hasn't any homemade food. My mother calls my sister in Oregon and says, can you believe that girl's letting a strange man in her house? I said to my sister, is it any wonder I'm still single? Brad showed up in a Jeep. He drives a Jeep. And he had a brown bomber jacket with a big patch Operation Iraqi Freedom on it. And we had a wonderful courtship. His next orders that year were to go to Germany. It was an amazing full circle. I like to say my dad left me his legacy and gave me my future. I didn't appreciate enough when I was growing up the fact that I was an Army daughter. And now I'm an Army wife. And it's really amazing, full circle, these gifts that I've been given in my life. Soon after my dad passed away, my mom told the ten of us kids she had an announcement to make. We couldn't imagine the topic. She proceeds to tell us, I'm done cooking forever. <laughs> I was out to an apple farm that fall and I found a sign in the same decor as my mother's kitchen. It says, kitchen closed, this chick has had it. <laughs> I'm very happy to tell you it's still hanging over my mother's stove in her house in Saginaw, where she lives by herself at the age of 93 years old. That December, or that Thanksgiving, we decided to shake things up a little bit, and I said, why don't I host down in Detroit? So my mother, at 84 years old, she got in the car and she drove to my house in Detroit. She sees my house is transformed, sheet protectors and binders and letters everywhere, and I'm writing publishing companies and all this, and she quietly sits down, my sweet little mom. I say little because my mother might be four, ten and a half now. Matter of fact, I like to walk her into her bedroom at night. I go up to Saginaw every week to be with her. I like to walk her into her bathroom and look in the mirror and rub her head like this. Because I can. And she says, did I birth you, kid? But my mother came down and she saw everything in my house and she was really quiet. And she said, I have something to tell you. She said, I have 400 of my letters back to your dad's 1,000 letters for the first two years that he was stateside. Now, my heart skipped a beat a little bit. I very quietly said, hmm, what are you thinking you're going to do with those? My mother proceeds to tell me that the day before, she decided they should stay private between she and my father, and she took them into the backyard to burn them. 
Oh, you're a good audience member. <laughs> However, she added, I wasn't sure of Saginaw Township from its burning. <laughs> now let me tell you, my mother goes to church every day it's offered because she should. And she drives with her hands at 10 and 2 because you're supposed to. So once again, when I recovered from it, I said, what are you thinking you're going to do with those letters? My mother tells me she's going to give them to me, but she has two conditions. One, I can't read them in her lifetime, which is fair. They're her letters. I have a real gift in having my dad's. And two, I had to promise to tell my brothers and sisters and her grandchildren that their courtship was pure. <laughs> I said, Mom, seriously, the worst thing Dad writes in the letters is I don't care who's listening on the party line tonight, even Father Cal. I better hear some receivers click because I'm going to say, I love you. I said, I think our young people could use a little bit of that kind of courtship these days. Yeah. Yes. But I, I wasn't looking at you guys. <laughs> well, let me tell you, in the end, when I found the mothers of Don and Jack, or the sister, brothers and sisters of Don and Jack Davis, and when I found in the trunk letters that my dad's parents wrote to them and put them in the book, my mother gave me permission to read her letters. I was not prepared for the fact that my mother's letters were sadder than my dad's. We forget what happened to stateside when all our soldiers went away in World War II. There was no one to work the farms, the Rosie the Riveters were moving into the factory, there was blackouts and food rationing and gas coupons. And I said to my mom one day, wow, mom, I can't even believe I thought I knew you better than any person on this earth. I love my mother. I respect her more than anybody I've ever known, past, present, or future. She is small in stature, but huge in grace and character and strength. And never once growing up did my parents tell us about those hardships. So I was floored. My mother went on to tell me the most amazing story. I didn't tell you that when I found my dad's letters, I also found a photograph album containing 250 corresponding pictures. Included in those pictures were atrocities from Germany. There was an event at the end of the war as the Germans were retreating in Gardelag in Germany. The Germans took 1,016 slave laborers, they locked them in a barn, and they set it on fire as they retreated. The reason, of course, they did that, the war was over and none of them would be able to testify if they killed them all. My dad's group came upon that right after it happened. My dad took photographs. And I didn't know for the longest time why, until three months after looking at those pictures so many times, I happened to turn over that little three by three photograph of one of those atrocities. And it had three very simple words, and I understood. Pictures don't lie. We knew then that we needed to include the photographs in the book. Well, he also has a picture of a group of Germans behind barbed wire fence. He's in an army of occupation and he's on guard duty and he writes a letter to his mom and he said, it's so hard to be on guard duty because all the German mothers are coming up to us and they beg us to let them walk up to the fence and talk to their boys. And my dad says, you know, mom, it makes me think, how would it feel if I were the prisoner of war and my mother were so close and yet we couldn't have any contact? Well, amazingly, my mother proceeds to tell me a story the very same time that my father is on guard duty in a prisoner of war camp in Germany, my mother in her little house in Merrill, Michigan, in that kitchen on their farm, she is cooking and serving lunch to the German prisoners of war that were bussed out from the Freeland prison camp to work her farm. I said to my mother, wow, now I have to tell you, I know I had history classes when I grew up. I did not know that 44 states in the United States housed prisoners of war from World War II. And they drove them out to all different farms and factories and places to do the jobs that there was no one to do. And I said to my mom one day, Mom, how did you feel about them? You have six little brothers and sisters. You read Dad's letter of Christmas Eve about them wading across the river to riddle one another with bullets. You read about April 9th. How did you feel knowing that in your neighborhood, my dad's farm neighborhood, his community, his three buddies that in the farms next to him, his best buddies, Babe Hansky came home a paraplegic. His fiance still wanted to marry him, but he said no because he didn't want to be a burden. 
They had died a bachelor at the age of 54. My dad's second buddy was Babe's brother, Frank Hatsky. Frank was killed in Europe and laid to rest. My dad's third buddy in his community on his farm road, he was shot down over France, and he left his two-year-old son, Michael, behind. I said to my mom, how did you feel about those young German boys at your table? How did you feel knowing that you told me every day everybody goes down to the general store and in the windows of the store there are lists missing in action, killed in action, wounded in action, prisoners of war. And if you walk through any house in America in World War II, what did you see in the windows of homes? <coughs> Stars. Blue for those who served that turned gold for those who fell. 406 in the Saginaw area alone were killed in World War II. I said to my mother, how did you feel about those German soldiers? I shouldn't have been surprised at my mother's heart. My mother said, I felt sad for them. They were young, they were afraid, they didn't speak English, and they didn't start this war. They did what their country asked them to do. Well, soon after I published the book, I went to a book fair to see if there was any interest and this gentleman came up to the table and he picked up the book and he read a couple pages and he put it down and he started walling up a little bit, pulled out a hanky and I said, Bill, are you a veteran by chance? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, thank you for your service to our country. And sadly, Bill felt the need to add a caveat. Bill said, but I served in Vietnam. To which I said, and thank you for your service to our country. The next week, Bill ordered three more books at our website. You can order signed books on our website. And he wanted three books for his adult sons that were home that weekend, and they loved the book. But Bill said, more so I'm writing to tell you that I don't remember the last time that someone said thank you to me for serving in Vietnam. You know what words came to mind? My mother's. They were young. They were afraid. They did not start this war, and they did what their country told them to do. I became pretty impassioned after that. I went to the person that I reported to for years, and I said, thank you so much for my opportunity here, but I'm giving notice because there's something that I need to go share. And it became more and more important to me as I traveled because I started meeting other people. My husband were down in Venice, Florida, and a gentleman came up and he said to Brad, are you in the military? He looks kind of military, don't you think? <laughs> he says, are you in the military? And Brad said, yes, I am. I said, my name is Scotty, and I'm from Maine. And he said, I was in Vietnam. And now I counsel our veterans of Vietnam, who he said, by the way, are dying at a younger age on average than any war in our history because of the psychological issues associated with Vietnam. Scotty proceeded to tell us that he was on an airplane back from Vietnam and all of a sudden over the loudspeaker, someone came up and said, everybody needs to get up in the, while we're in the air, get up and get your duffel bags and get into civilian clothes because we have lines of protesters waiting at the airport. Scotty says, we came off that plane and there were ropes on either side that we were to walk through. And he said, remember those old 45 records? And we said, yeah. He said, they had stacks of them. And they used them to fling them at us as we walked down the ropes. He said, and I won't even tell you the other things that they threw at us that day. I met another gentleman that came to a book event. And he said, you know, I picked my brother up at the Detroit airport. He came around the luggage carousel. And I started cheering for my brother when I saw him, and he said, you know what happened? Everybody around me booed me. And then another gentleman bought a book, and he bought a second book for a buddy who was in Vietnam, and he said, could you do me a favor and write three simple words that all his life he's been so angry and so hurt that nobody ever said to him, welcome home. Well, I left my job, and I become impassioned in something, because I'll tell you why. One thing is I think it's important to remember our history, but more so, I have something that I need to tell you all that I believe we're supposed to do. Instead of lamenting the loss of our greatest generation, there's something we're supposed to do to honor that because we now are holding the baton. We are the next generation now that has to take care of this wonderful country that has given us our freedoms. And before I leave you with a message of your citizenship, and what I would like to task you to do before I close tonight, I'd like to do one, one brief reading. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. You might think that when the war ended, 
People said to our veterans of World War II, rest well, weary soldier, you've done your part. And instead, our World War II generation came home to be known as the greatest generation, and they grazed families with prayer, and family dinners, and music, and understanding the value of life and love, and not necessarily material things, because everybody was starting over. But this particular letter was written to the men of the 102nd by Major General Frank A. Keating, charging them with their next mission. And he wrote, No history, regardless of our effort, could ever depict the indomitable courage, tenacity of purpose, and outstanding accomplishments of the men of this division during our campaigns in northern France and Germany. From the day we embarked in New York Harbor until the cessation of hostilities, your exploits continually contributed to the defeat of the mightiest army on earth and aided in bringing peace to all mankind. The hardships you endured last winter were severe and they taxed your heart and your soul, as did the terrific ordeals of combat in which you participated for 194 consecutive days. Never once did you fail, no matter how difficult the task. Nor was the resolution to accomplish any mission by the frontline soldier and the men supporting him. Anything short of superb in efficiency and dogged determination. I could never express the deep admiration I hold for your faithfulness, loyalty, perseverance, and fidelity. Nor can I ever tell you how proud and privileged I am to have served with you. There is but one more battle to fight, and I know you shall not be found wanting in the completion of this mission. It is the battle for perpetual peace and a better world in which to live. You have a very definite task to perform, and you must prosecute it with the same spirit with which you fought. As citizens of this, the finest country on this planet, I hope you shall take back with you an indelible impression of the better things in life, a more thorough understanding of human nature and mankind in general, and a full realization of your duties of citizenship. They are as definite, serious, and obligatory as the tasks you performed in uniform. Never forget this responsibility. Many of our comrades will not see or read this brief history of the 102nd Infantry. They repose an eternal sleep. They gave their lives for us and for our country that we may carry on where they left off. Wherever you go, whatever you do, remember the pride and the prestige that this division has established and never lower our standards. You have done a magnificent job and I commend you. Major General Frank A. Keating. I went to speak at my dad's hometown library in Hemlock. And one week before I did, a senior in high school committed suicide from bullying. And a 29-year-old man, newly married with a baby on the way, took his life, and to this day no one knows why. And I think about that. I think about the fact that I don't want our young people to have to go fight a war, and we certainly don't want to see war in our land, but what we do want to make sure is that people realize the worst thing in the world is not going on vacation without our iPhone chargers. And we need to remember when we go out to, we go out to restaurants anymore, what's everybody doing at the table? Everybody's texting on their iPhones. Now I'm the first to tell you, I have four nieces that when texting first came out, they stayed overnight. Now of course I had to sleep in my room. I turn off the light at 11.30 and I hear tick, 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 tick. And I said, girls, who are you texting at 11.30 at night? And they all said, each other. <laughs> it's so wonderful, the many gifts and blessings and rights and freedoms that we've been given in our lives. But we also have to remember that we now have to keep our history alive. We now are the ones to pick up the baton in our own communities. It is not about entitlement, it's about opportunity. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do. It's our turn now. We are now the citizens who are holding our communities. I'm very sorry to tell you, but here in your beautiful community of Sault Ste. Marie today, someone felt tremendous despair. Someone felt very dark in their minds. They couldn't get out of their thoughts. They couldn't stop seeing that life wasn't worth living. They, they just perhaps needed the kindness of someone to pass them on the street and say hello. Someone to say, my, you look nice and red. 
my, what a beautiful day today. They needed to go somewhere and not just have someone say next, but see the human being in front of them. I used to tell my travel team in the corporate world, you have to make two non-work related statements before you start your business transaction. And I'll tell you what else. Every single day, here's your job. You don't have to go to fight a war. You just have to look to your left and to your right and to the human being in front of you. And every day you need to see the person who needed you. Because sometimes we see what we don't have and we forget to see that we have something that somebody else needed us today. When Brad and I were setting up today, we were really touched by the sign, How to Build a Community. It had a whole bunch of lines in it that we wish we could duplicate this and blow it up and send it out. Because you know what? Everyone is simple. Everyone is free. And everyone is the single one thing you can do to change your own community every day. I often think about that student in Hemlock High School. If one student, one young person, had had the courage to walk across that cafeteria and stand next to the person who was being bullied, do you know that that person would have had the power to give the gift of life that night? We just need to move out of what we need and see those around us. And you know what happens? People start coming to see St. Marie and wonder what you're drinking in the water here. <laughs> So the best way that we can honor the gifts that we've been given is to take care of our communities and each other. And to remember every day when we forget to see the value of life outside of the things that we're, we're disappointed about in our lives, remember that someone died trying to get home. Remember when Veterans Day comes on November 11th, instead of just driving by your beautiful cemetery and thinking how amazingly it looks with all the flags on it, Stop with your family and read the name of someone that was willing to give their lives for us. We are indeed the land of the free because of the brave. Thank you all so much for being my latest Costco size loaf of bread. I'm proud to tell you that these events, when we finish up, these 11 that we have up here will be 220 since we started. Wow. And while Brad's gone on his next mission to Stuttgart, Germany, I'm just going to keep going and sharing it because, again, the best way we support those is to take good care of our troops when they come home. And no matter what you feel about the wars that are happening in our world, past or present, the bottom line is we have people that were willing to put on a uniform and move towards danger on behalf of us. And every single one of those people deserves our gratitude and our respect. And somebody asked me in an event recently, it was a college student, and she said, my dad told me never to ask my grandpa about Vietnam. She said, make sure you never, ever bring it up. How do you feel about that? And I said, you know what? Not to disrespect or disregard your dad's direction, but I have a really hard time believing that your grandpa wouldn't have some bit of happiness inside that his 19-year-old granddaughter was aware of the things that brought her life to this day. So whether or not he wants to share, I hope you still walk up and you say thank you. With that, um, we do have books with us. If you're interested, we published 320 of the letters and 104, book, 104 photographs. Um, the introduction is on our website, A Thousand Letters Home, as is uh, some letter excerpts and photographs and our upcoming events. And uh, we can accommodate check cash or credit card. We have soft cover and hard cover. The ebook is also on our website. And other than that, um, again, just thank you so much to the library, to Tender Care, to the library friends, and to all of you for giving your beautiful night tonight. And please remember, tomorrow is the first day to make a whole new difference in your world around you every single day. Thank you very much, and God bless.